the joints, the upper limbs, the sternoclavicular joint. This is a synovial subtle joint formed by the medial end of the clavicle with the manubrium. An articular disc separates the two articular surfaces. The clavicular notch of the manubrium is located superolaterally on either side of the depression of the sternal notch. The joint can be identified by moving the clavicle superiorly and inferiorly by elevating and depressing the shoulder complex. Alternatively, ask the patient to protract and retract the shoulders. The acromioclavicular joint. This is formed by the distal end of the clavicle with the acromion. It is about 2 cm medially from the most lateral part of the acromion. The spine of the scapula, as it travels laterally, becomes thickened and more prominent, turning anteriorly and slightly medially to become the acromion. Although it is a plain synovial joint, it permits very little movement and therefore it is difficult to palpate unless pressure is exerted either on the clavicle or on the acromion. The shoulder joint. More specifically, the glenohumeral joint is a synovial ball and socket joint. It is formed by the shallow glenoid fossa on the lateral and superior part of the scapula and the head of the humerus. The joint lies deep within the muscles and ligaments of the pectoral girdle and thus it is not easy to palpate. The proximal part of the humerus has the greater and lesser tuberosities which protrude in a superior direction. Axial rotation of the humerus makes this area palpable. A slight depression below the arch of the acromion marks the position of the superior part of the head of the humerus, the elbow joint. Like the shoulder, this is a collective name for several articulations. The humeroalna joint is a synovial hinge joint located in the medial part of the elbow. The trochlea of the humerus articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna. The joint line is about 2 cm below the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The anterior part of the humeroalna joint is not palpable due to muscles overlying it. Posteriorly, the olecranon, a proximal projection of the ulna, can be palpated with ease when the arm is flexed to 90 degrees. The proximal radioalna joint. The proximal radioalna joint is a synovial pivot type joint enabling the forearm to pronate and supinate. The neck of the radius contains the annular ligament. The superior surface of the head of the radius articulates with the capitulum of the ulna. The head of the radius may be palpated on the lateral part of the supinated forearm, about one centimeter distal to the joint line of the humeroalna joint. Use a gripping hold with the thumb and index finger whilst pronating and supinating the forearm. The distal radioalna joint. This is also a pivot joint, but without the distinct head of the proximal radioalna joint. Conversely, the distal head of the ulna is more cylindrical. The joint line is about one centimeter above the line of the wrist. The styloid process of the ulna and radius may be used as landmarks. The distal head of the radius is broader, forming the largest articulation with the proximal carpal row. The joint line may be felt during flexion and extension. However, the joint line cannot be felt during pronation and supination, as the whole wrist follows the movement of the distal radioalna joint. The wrist and radiocarpal joint. This is an ellipsoid joint formed by the radius and the proximal row of carpal bones. The carpal bones on the ulna side only make an indirect contact with the triguitral via the articular disc 
during ulnar deviation. The retiocarpal joint is made up of the distal end of the retius with an articular disc separated from scaphoid, lunate, and tracheotral bones. Find the slotted process of the radius and progress towards the center of the wrist line. Feel its principal movements, that is flexion, extension, medial and lateral deviation. With the right grip above and below, you can also assess distraction. The intercarpal joints. These are several synovial plane articulations between the carpal bones. Movement is not easy to detect due to tight ligamentous stability. The carpal metacarpal joints. These are the articulations between the distal carpal row and the long metacarpals. The joints are roughly 2 cm distal to the wrist joint. The second to fifth joints are synovial ellipsoid joints with a nominal degree of movement. However, the first carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb exhibits great range of movement. The trapezium forms a subtle synovial articulation with the first proximal phalanx. To feel the movement, grip the distal end of the first metacarpal and move the thumb in all planes. The metacarpal phalangeal joints. These are synovial, condyloid or ellipsoid joints formed by the rounded heads of the metacarpal bones with the shallow cavities of the proximal end of the phalanges, with the exception of that of the thumb. The former are capable of 90 degree flexion. Making a fist makes these articulations prominent, with the third metacarpophalangeal joint usually more prominent. The metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb is orientated at right angles to the other metacarpophalangeal joints and only able to do 45 degrees flexion. The interphalangeal joints. The interphalangeal articulations of the hand are synovial hinge joints between the phalanges. There are two sets of joints except in the thumb. The proximal interphalangeal joints are those between the proximal and intermediate phalanges and the distal interphalangeal joints are those between the intermediate and distal phalanges. As the thumb only has two phalanges, it only has one interphalangeal joint. They are all capable of 90 degrees flexion. Joints of the axial skeleton. The manubriosternal joint or angle of Lewis. In most subjects, this marks a horizontal elevated ridge on the superior part of the sternum, approximately 4 cm below the suprasternal notch. Roll your fingertips or glide them over the skin to feel the joint line. On either side of the joint is the sternocostal union of the second costal cartilage. This is a useful landmark for orientation over the thorax. The costochondral joints. This is the union of the bony component of each rib with the cartilaginous counterpart. These are not usually palpable depending on individual's morphology. They are highly cartilaginous joints. Each rib has a depression shaped like a cup that the costal cartilage articulates with. There is normally no movement at these joints. Joints between costal cartilages of ribs 6 to 9 are plain synovial joints. Articulation between the costal cartilage of ribs 9 and ribs 10 are fibrous. The cartilage component in the upper ribs is much smaller, whilst in the lower ribs much longer. Therefore, the costochondral joints range in distance from the sternum from approximately 3 cm for ribs 1 and 2, 10 to 12 cm for the middle section, and 18 cm for ribs 10 the sternocostal joints. These refer to the joints between the costal cartilages and the sternum. Articulations of the cartilages of the true ribs with the sternum are arthrotial joints, with the exception of the first rib. 
In the first rib, the cartilage is directly united with the sternum. It is therefore a synarthrodial articulation or primary cartilaginous joint. The sternocostal joint of the first rib is deep and just inferior to the sternoclavicular joint. It permits very little movement. The second costal cartilage is attached to the manubriosternal joint, which is in slight recession in relation to the first and third sternocostal joints. The direct sternocostal connections only go as far as rib 7. The costal cartilages of ribs 8, 9 and 10 articulate with each other, forming interchondral synovial joints. If the lower border of these articulations is followed laterally, they form the subcostal angle. The costal vertebral joints. These are articulations that connect the heads of the ribs with the bony bodies of the thoracic vertebrae. Each rib head has two convex facets. These facets articulate with the bodies of two adjacent vertebrae. Their position is anterolateral to the posterior vertebral segments, and as they are shielded by the transverse processes, they are therefore impalpable. However, in an inflamed costal vertebral and costal transverse joint, deep pressure in the paraspinal gutter may elicit tenderness. The costal transverse joints. Each rib articulates with the transverse process of the respective vertebra via small synovial facet joints. Posteriorly, the costal transverse joints may be palpated indirectly, lying in the paravertebral depression. The symphysis pubis. This forms the anterior articulation of the pelvic girdle, uniting the superior rami of the left and right pubic bones. The posterior articulation being the sacroiliac joints. It is a secondary cartilaginous joint. It is located anterior to the urinary bladder and superior to the external genitalia. For females, it is above the vulva, and for males, it is above the penis. The superior surface of the pubic bone can be traced medially until the pubic tubercles are felt. The brim of the true pelvis is roughly 4 cm above the genitalia. Between the left and right tubercles, a small depression signifies the cartilage and intra-articular disc. Joints of the lower limbs. The hips. The hips are analogous to the glenohumeral joints, both being ball and socket in type, but with the hips being much more congruent and stable. The hip joints are located lateral to the gluteal region, inferior to the iliac crest and overlying the greater trochanter of the femur. Unlike the glenohumeral joint, the hip is shielded by the thickness of the gluteal muscles. The greater trochanter is about 10 cm distal to the iliac crest. The head of the femur in relation to the greater trochanter is located superomedially. The tibiofemoral or knee joint. This is a synovial, condyloid, hinge-like joint, which permits flexion and extension, as well as slight medial and lateral rotation. The joint line of the knee, that is the area between the femoral and tibiocondyles, can be identified by a soft depression on either side of the inferior part of the patella when the knee is in 90 degree flexion. The patellofemoral joint. This is a gliding surface between the posterior surface of the patella and the femoral trochlea. An area between the lateral and medial ridges of the anterior femoral condyles. Only the peripheral margins of the patellofemoral articulation can be palpated. To take the tension of the patella tendon and ligament, have the knee fully extended. The superior tibiofibular joint. This is a synovial joint between the lateral condyle of the tibia and the head of the fibula. The fibular head is located posterolateral to the tibiocondyle about 1 to 2 centimeters 
below the margin of the tibial plateau. Movement of the superior tibiofibular joint can be demonstrated by the foot being taken into full plantar flexion, then dorsiflexion. The inferior tibiofibular joint. This fibrous syndesmosis is formed by the rough convex surface of the medial side of the lower end of the fibula and the rough concave surface on the lateral side of the tibia. Like its superior counterpart, this joint cannot be palpated as it is located deep within the tibia. The joint lies about 3 cm above the tip of the lateral malleolus, the tibiotalar joint. The tibiotalar or talocrural joint forms the main component of the ankle joint. It is a synovial hinge joint that connects the distal end of the tibia and fibula with the proximal end of the talus. The articular surfaces of the tibia and talus are concealed between the malleoli. The most superior part of the talar surface is on a horizontal line 2 cm above the medial malleolus. The anterior part of the articular surface of the talus can be exposed when the foot is taken into full plantar flexion. The talonavicular joint. It is a synovial modified ball and socket joint. On the medial and inferior aspect of the midline foot locate the tubicle of the navicular. This protrusion is 2.5 cm anteriorly and inferiorly to the tip of the medial malleolus. The joint line can be traced as a curved, slightly convex line anteriorly. The middle of the joint line is about 3 cm anterior to the medial malleolus. The metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe. The metatarsophalangeal joints share many common anatomical and functional properties to the metacarpophalangeal joints. For the big toe, grasp the length of the metatarsal with one hand and the first proximal phalanx with the other hand and take the hallux into flexion and extension. Accessory movements are also possible.